anyone with your comments um, from the Empire of Normality video. So we're on to part 12 now. Okay, so one of you says, I think Chapman is, a, is on stronger grounds when he talks about capitalism's impact on mental health. But I still think he makes a category confusion because capitalists tend to view poverty as rooted in the individual and not caused by the system and not caused by the systemic functioning of capitalism itself. I can see how Chapman can extend that to criticise the medical model. However, I think that's a mistake because Poverty, as real as it is, is only real in relation to the fiction that is money and economy. In societies with no money and no wealth accumulation, there is no poverty, so poverty is 100% a social construct. Illnesses and disorders are, however, biologically and physically real. One thing that capitalism has done, which I believe has really damaged mental health, is the promotion of the idea of happiness. Happiness is central to getting people to buy stuff that they don't need, because you see... Because you sell them the idea that purchasing the items will bring this state of happiness. The ACT Therapy themed book, The Happiness Trap, goes into this idea quite a bit. That said, I personally make a distinction between mental ill health, which I definitely think is on the rise, and, how a predominantly, and has a predominantly social origin, versus mental illness, which is far rarer and more biologically rooted. So thank you for that, that's an interesting distinction you've made between yeah mental ill health and mental illness yeah and I agree um obviously um you know neoliberal capitalism in particular has definitely undoubtedly um contributed to an increase in mental suffering I mean you know if someone's you know, living in a state of fear all the time, or stress, financial stress or whatever, and insecurity, that's obviously not going to be great for someone's mental health, and that's going to cause extreme stress and anxiety in and of itself. And that's the case for anyone, regardless of whether or not they're prone to mental illness. But yeah, you've made an important distinction in that, that's, while that in and of itself is awful and systemic, um, and has a systemic solution, in other words, if you, if you um, resolve that situation, these people will no longer be mentally unwell. Um, that is 100% socially caused, but as you've made clear, that is quite different to people who have a biological vulnerability to mental illness, which, and that biological vulnerability to mental illness will exist no matter what society that we live in. So you can imagine, like, a perfect kind of socialist society... <laughs> you know, where everyone is cared for and there's no insecurity and all of that. You'll expect to see that a lot the stress levels in the society will go down, anxiety levels in general will go down, but you'll still see people with mental illness because actual mental illness has a biological origin and people can be mentally ill even if they're really secure and don't have any of those stresses I just mentioned. People can still become mentally ill. And in those cases, you can see that it has a very strong biological root. Um, so, yes, so there are two, two, two situations there. And the other issue is that um, you could put two people in two highly traumatic, stressful environments. Both of them are going to experience some stress. That's natural. Both of them are going to experience anxiety. That's natural. But, but, but one of them might go on to develop a really serious mental illness. One of them might be pushed over the edge to develop extremely severe mental illness, although arguably they probably already had a vulnerability there already and they may well have already had previous symptoms that just weren't as severe and now this traumatic event has kind of pushed them over. Um, but the other person may well experience uh, higher levels of stress, but once the situation is resolved, the, uh, that person who experienced an elevation of stress will then get stress levels and then go back down and they will no longer have a mental health issue. Whereas the person who's developed a mental illness will carry on with the mental illness even when the situation has resolved because that person has a biological vulnerability. Um, so yes, so I agree with you. I think there, there is a clear distinction between society, societally-induced mental ill health 
and actual genuine mental illness. Genuine mental illness is a lot rarer and it has primarily a biological origin. A bit like, say, someone like me with OCD. I would have the OCD no matter what society because it has a biological origin. That's not to deny the social aspect at all. It's biopsychosocial because obviously my OCD does respond to stress. And if I was in, I mean, and I have a lot of stress in my life right now, thanks to social services, not really helping me, which is really not helping my mental health. But, um, yeah, biopsychosocial. But what I mean is, is that if I was given all the support I needed and I didn't have this constant stress of social services not helping me properly because of cuts and things like that and austerity, um, I'd be in a lot better place. And also, if I was given the therapy I needed and things like that, I'd be in a lot better place. And if I was helped a lot younger, I'd be in a lot better place. So that's the society aspect. Um, but I still have this vulnerability to OCD because that is innate, that's biological, that's rooted. So it's a biopsychosocial model. I feel that reducing it all 100% to society or conversely to biology is reductionistic. And it always strikes me as rather strange why so many people don't seem to realise that there is such a thing as a biopsychosocial model, which is, to me, really balanced and holistic, but they never, I would never mention it. But yeah, so yeah, good points there. So, next comment, it says, to be diagnosed with autism, it is supposed to be significantly impacting your life. I do think that some low support needs people minimise their impairment and claim it is all due to society when it's probably not. Yeah, I do feel that a lot of people are actually in denial, I agree with you. Next comment. For me, autism is a pervasive disorder that impacts multiple domains, in addition to employment, such as family life, social life, personal life, education, etc. Chapman's focus on a neoliberal capitalist economy might shed light as to why employment may be more difficult now for autistic people, but it can't account for autism itself or the pervasive nature of impairment. The condition that Asperger and Sukhavira described, Sukhavira, sorry, Sukhavira described, fits the experiences of many autistics today, thus showing that the expansion of the autism criteria was not the creation of something new, but the recognition of something that already existed when the economy and society were different in many ways than now. Yeah, I agree with you. A lot, yeah, thank you for that. So next comment. Yes, working is only part of the equation. Yep, next point. I'm, the next one point says, I'm torn on autism increasing. I think if it is, I think probably the main reason is all the sharper women are carrying autism genes. And these days they're in a professional class, doctor and lawyer. And they only marry men in professional classes and they have a lot of Asperger's too. And this natural selection of the women hooked up for men, only with these high focus, high memory genes. The number one profession for a parent with autistic child is doctor, and the number two, engineer. And the engineers, like my dad, are way too autistic to believe in diagnosis. And another one, if he says, my dad was an engineer, he is probably autistic. Interesting points. I'm not sure what I believe there, really, I'd have to think about it. I mean, one of the issues, of course, is that if you're in a professional class, you're going to be more aware of autism, like you're going to be more educated. So that might explain why you might see a preponderance of diagnoses in those classes, just because people tend to have more awareness. Whereas if you're, say, lower down the social scale, less educated, um, maybe people are less likely to get diagnosed as autistic. I think there is a kind of class in inequity there, because obviously if you're in a more educated class, you are going to have more of that awareness of, neurodevelopmental conditions, particularly if you're a doctor, you're going to know more about autism. Um, so I'm not necessarily sure that there are more autism in, in, in doctors and lawyers and people like that. I think a lot of it is just that they're more aware of autism, because you'd have to kind of, because you know, like like I say, like I reckon that a lot of people in lower social classes just don't get diagnosed, they're less likely to get diagnosed because they're less likely to be aware of autism. You know, if you're an educated parent who knows about autism, you're going to push to get diagnosis. You also can pay for a diagnosis, you can jump the queue, um, you can get a private diagnosis, which isn't obviously going to be available to those lower down the social scale. So I, I do think that it is probably mainly... Um, education and money essentially guiding the 
possibly relative increase in autism diagnoses in those higher up the scale. Uh, not I don't think it's necessarily anything to do with genes. Um, but that said, it is possible that if you, uh, that there are certain uh, lines of work that do attract people who carry a higher number of autistic traits. So I know that um, Simon Van Cohen has rather controversially done some work into this area because it's mainly focusing on um, STEM, science, technology, um, economics, maths type work um, which some people have obviously said plays into stereotypes um, and there may well be other professions